All right. So for the activity that we're going to be doing this week, the assignment with this boasting activity, um, I what I did is I included the text from last week. The actual assignment is still in module three, so you can go back and access it where it has the where it has the actual. Where's that? Where's my finger? There it is. Okay. Um, where it actually has the text and the um, examples that I provided. So here you have your bow slot Beowulf, where basically I was asking you to create a bow similar to what you saw in the text. You were going to be doing that about yourself. So your uh, your name, your accomplishments, where you're from, uh, whether it's like academic, athletic accomplishments, you've moved up in your job and now you are the um, the leader of shifts or whatever at Hardee's. Like, okay, so now you're in charge of everybody. So you're, you're bragging on yourself. You're giving yourself a little credit because that's what Beowulf does in the course of the text. In order to make him seem like this epic hero, well, he's gotta let everybody know what he's done before in order for them to believe, okay, this guy knows what he's doing and we can trust him. So you're gonna do the same stuff. So you're gonna be sort of framing your life in this similar fashion. So like 15, 20 lines, you should have been able to go through last week and do that. I gave you some examples of the boasts that you'll see in Beowulf. Uh, we'll actually talk through some of these. Um, so for example, if let's say uh, Allison, uh, all, all the time when she was a kid, she was like undefeated in everything she did, like a spell and beat champion, whatever. Okay, so she might say, the days of my youth were filled with glory. The bees rang with letters or what, whatever. Like come up with something, right? So it's, it's just a way to help you sort of see how they were phrasing it. Because I want you to put your bows into a similar format. So it's not going to be exact. Because um, I don't think most of you guys will say um, that your people have seen your strength for themselves and watched you rise from the darkness of war dripping with your enemy's blood. I don't think many of y'all can say that and claim that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what you're into. But, again, it's going to be based on the same kind of ideas. You're going to be using that same sort of framing method to put your uh, life into that. So for this final draft, so we're going to discuss text one and text two. So we're going to discuss where it first introduces Beowulf and uh, after it introduces Grindle, it introduces Beowulf. That was the part that we got stuck on last uh, week and we didn't get a chance to get all the way through. And then we get to see those two fight, which is my favorite part of this whole thing. Um, and now I do have an in-class version of the instructions and a virtual or in-class absent. So for example, some of our folks that aren't here this morning, they'll be able to go on uh, line here and they'll see, okay, this is what we talked about in class. So they were given uh, materials, we did in-class discussions, which they're gonna be able to view uh, through the videos, and that'll be how that they can get this done. Does that make sense? Good? All right. So we'll be working on this today. We're gonna start off by sort of just recapping what we talked about last week. So looking back at uh, the text we had last week, you want to go ahead in module four on your computers. If you want to open up to text number one, so you can follow along a little bit easier there. I'm gonna have you guys reading uh, here in just a minute too. Everybody's getting that way. We should all be in there. All right, so let's start off with what we talked about last week. So we talked about um, Grendel, this monster, and 
we mentioned sort of the big scenario that was happening. So when we first started off with our reading last week, he gave us this little paragraph here at the top of the page where it uh, has uh, the actual title. Um, and it starts off here, Crossgar, King of the, uh, King of the Danes is built. What did he build? What was the thing that was like sort of our starting impetus for the, for the story? So what did Hrothgar build that brought everything sort of starting? Oh, it's not that early, guys. Hey, I, I woke up this morning four o'clock. Y'all, y'all should be y'all should be wide awake by this point. All right, what did he build? What's the thing they built? What did you say, Mason? What did he build? Just up there in those first couple lines. What's Rothgar build? Hero. Hero. Yeah, Harry. Okay. And what what happens to Harry? What do they do? What's the big deal with him? Okay, he built a thing. Why does that matter? What? It, so he's just built this brand new thing for his community. He's the king in charge of the community. What are they going to do now that he's built something brand new? What you think, Fredo? So he's just built this brand new oh, meat this hall, this place for them to get together. To Say it again. Ah, uh, okay. So they congregate and make merry. So basically they're doing what? What are they doing? So if they're making merry and they're congregating, they're getting together. Come on, guys. Y'all just trying to make me look foolish in front of the virtuals. <laughs> Come on now. What's happening? What are they doing? He's just built something brand new. He's super stoked about it. What's he going to make his people do? Yeah, they're going to talk about it for sure, but they're going to party, right? They're going to party down. That's, that's the whole point of this whole community. They just like to party because every other second you see them, they're getting together, they're feasting, and they're just having a good time. And so we had this happen. So they're just partying it up, having a good old time, and then all of a sudden, Things sort of take a turn. What happens that sort of switches things up? What's our what's our issue that we have here at the start? Oh, okay, we have a powerful monster, and what's that monster gonna do? Is he gonna join the party, have fun? No. Invade no. The meat he does what? Invade the meat ah, there you go. He invades it, right? So he takes it down. He's ready. He's ready to bring some death and destruction. Why is he so upset? At these dudes having a party. They're having a good time. Why is this monster so upset? Is it because he wasn't invited? Why is he so mad? What sort of brings him on to go there and kill everybody? Because they're not celebrating him. They're not celebrating him. Good. And again, the people that the people that he's celebrating and that these people are celebrating is his like mortal enemy. Because again, who was what what does Grendel come from? Remember when we read down a little bit farther, we talked about where he came from. He's a powerful monster. Where did he spawn out of? Hmm. Yeah. So he came out of the darkness, right? So he's he's. We can pretty well assume just from that he's evil of some sort, right? He is just plain straight up evil. So probably these dudes having a good time celebrating God and life, probably not going to be the greatest thing for an evil monster to look at. Space room, I'm certain. No, this is uh, Mr. Schmidt. She's in room uh, 12 now. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. All right. Anyway, so we have our monster. He's hearing all these people party, so he, he sort of gets sick of it. He just hates hearing them over and over again. They're just having such a good time, and he's not invited. He's just all evil, and he just wants to murder some things. So he goes up there, and he starts killing. So he brings the death and destruction to these guys as he invades that meat hall. All right. 
And essentially, he just sort of snaps because he's sick of listening to these dudes party every single day, night after night after night. All they do is have a good time and sing about how great God is and how he made the earth and how everything's awesome. Grendel hates that. That's just junk to him. He doesn't like that at all. So we have, again, we talked about Grendel. Uh, Tilda Monster started down here, uh, line 15. Um, so we have, they were singing. So Rock Hard Ben lived happy in his hall. Uh, Till the monster stirred, that demon, that fiend Grendel, who haunted the moors, the wild marshes, made his home in a hell, not hell, but earth. And they say he was spawned in this sort of slime. What specific person or group does Grendel come from? Because it says he's like pure evil, but where does it sort of say he's from? Like, who's his dad? So looking down here, route Line 20 ish to like 25. Where's Randall coming in? Come on, big man, what you got? So he was, it says he was conceived of something. What was he conceived of? Okay, a pair of monsters born of Cain, murderous creatures banished by God. Okay, why is, okay, who is Cain, first off? Help me out here, guys. I, no idea. Help me out. What, who is Cain? We talked about it last week, didn't we? Was that, was that not part of something we did? No? Yeah? No? No. Okay, so at least we got somebody that's yeah, know the story, scholar yeah. up at least. Yeah, know the story, yeah. So we have son of Adam and Eve. What can he do? Why is he so important for us now? Why do we care about him? Yeah. So Cain is the first murderer in human history. I, I thought we got to this part yes, uh, last week. That's on me. I knew we skipped something. I didn't know it was this. Okay. So we have Cain, who is the first murderer in the Bible. So in first recorded history. So you have Adam and Eve, they decide to sin. They do the thing that God told them not to do, which was eat of a specific tree in the garden that was going to make them like God as the knowledge of good and evil. And they did. They learned about it because they did the wrong thing and they did evil. So God kicked them out of the garden. They were having a good time with God. It was harmonious. They got to talk with God each evening. It was a great time. Then they get kicked out on their butts. And they're out here. Now they have to work the land. They have to actually do a lot of the stuff out here, uh, you have to raise your own cattle and your food and all this stuff, it's going to be work, which is what we experience now. And so they have, they have two sons, they have Cain and Abel. Abel, he takes care of all like the livestock, the animals, things like that. And Cain, he does all the farming. So he does all the like vegetables and grows all the grains and all that. So Cain and Abel, they're both trying to give their sort of thanks to God. They give offerings to get forgiveness of the sins, the bad stuff that they did. They're going to give offerings to God to ask him to forgive. So Cain and Abel both bring their offerings. Abel brings his best, the firstborn, the like, perfect, spotless little lamb, and he brings that, he offers that to God. God accepts that offering. He's like, yep, that's good. You gave me the absolute best you had. Cain he doesn't really bring his best. He brings like maybe like the third or second best. Uh, he kept like the best fruits for himself. Like he kept that stuff for himself instead of giving his best to God. He just said, eh, I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll give you some, but I'm not going to give you like the best stuff. That's for me. And so when he gave that and he did that offering, God did not accept it. And it was not accepted. So Cain ticked off. His little brother's gift got accepted above his. Oh, that drove him nuts. He was so mad. So he asked, he asked, hey, why don't you let's, let's go out to the field and just, you know, we'll talk and do whatever we do at this point. Which I, I guess is plain catch. I don't know. So as they're out there, Cain and Abel, Cain just straight up kills him. He is so mad that God accepted his stuff over his. 
that he takes a big old rock. You can you see all the blood splatters on the floor. It's just a massacre. It's the first murder that's ever happened. So what happens is God hears about it. God knows. He asks Cain, hey, where's your brother, man? He's like, am I in charge of my brother? Am I the guy that's supposed to keep up with Abel? I, I didn't think my name was Abel's keeper. Um, I thought I was Cain. And so, again, God's like, hey, I hear the blood screaming from the ground of your brother after you just murdered him. I know what's up. So what he does, he kicks uh, Cain out. He banishes him. He puts the curse on him. And whoever kills Cain is going to be cursed seven times more. And so all of sort of humans, humanity's like plots and like the bad stuff that's happened, at least in terms of what Beowulf is saying here, it's sort of taken as it comes from Cain and then all of the world's problems were birthed out. So monsters, goblins, ghouls, um, just the awful, horrible things, these kind of creatures, they came from the fact that Cain did this fatty. And it sort of cursed everybody forever. I, I'm so upset I didn't get a chance to get to that with you guys last week. I think we got cut short on time, wasn't it? We had the, we had the fire drill. That's right. That was it. Yeah. And we have another one, sir. Oh. Okay. Two? Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Um, so that changes things up a little bit because I want to make sure that we get to that battle today and I want to give us enough time to do that. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you some high points on some of these texts just so that we can get down to the spots I want us to hit. So basically what Grendel does, he goes up, he murders as many people as possible. He goes into the uh, Herod, this uh, great meat hall, which is like this place everybody gathers and gets together as a community. Um, we talked about how important community was the other week. Same kind of thing. They're all getting together. They're having a good time. Grendel comes in in the middle of the night because he's not going to do it in the day. He's smart enough. He sneaks in there. He kills like 30 dudes. He picks them up with his one hand. So he's a huge monster. Kills these 30 dudes with one hand, smashes them, and just bolts. He goes back to this swampy, awful place far away from where Herod is where he lives. So Rothgar, pretty upset. Most of his better soldiers are now dead. And he is not feeling that great. Now, Hrothgar, he's not able to be killed. Even though Grendel really wants to, he can't kill him because he was the king. And the king was sort of di like divinely given like this sort of force field, I guess, where since God chose the king, Grendel, who's against God, who's been trying to kill everything good, he can't really do that. He can't touch and get up to the spot where Hrothgar's at. So he's just going to kill everybody else around him to make him feel bad as best he can. He's got he's to still make him feel bad in some way. So that's what he does. He kills most of his uh, people. He comes night after night, uh, so set on murder that no crime would ever be enough. No savage assault quenches lust for evil. Um, and as they tried to kill him, they couldn't kill him because their swords... There was like this, again, this curse on Grendel that basically made human weapons not be able to pierce him. Like nothing could go through his skin. Spears, swords, you know, hurtful comments. Nothing could get through to this guy. There's no way that you could really attack him. So it's just, you just had to deal with it, basically. He's going to come in, he's going to kill people, he's going to leave. And hopefully it's not you this time. That's sort of where you were having to sit at here in this sort of section. And let's see, and that's pretty much what goes on. He continues these crimes over and over again. It's actually spread across the world where they hear of how awful this stuff is that's happening. And it reaches out to a dude named Babel, who is across the sea. So here's what I'm going to have you guys do. I want you guys to read. Let's read this first section together, this uh, 104 to 1. Oh, eight. We'll read this together, talk through it briefly. Then I'm going to set you loose and I'm going to let you read a section. And then we'll come back together, discuss that, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? All right. So looking at this first section, this is on page five on your PDF, uh, but it's line 104. So if you're following along on the actual text, it'll say Beowulf, line 104. 
So the living sorrow of Helfdane's son simmered, bitter and fresh, and no wisdom or strength could break it. The agony hung on king and people alike, harsh and unending, violent and cruel and evil. Okay, let's look here. Now, we talked about who Beowulf was supposed to be. What, what is Beowulf? Who is that dude? We talked about who he's supposed to be in the course of this story. The story's named after him, for Pete's sake. So who is he? So thinking back to what we talked about with Beowulf and the epic heroes. So it, hmm? Yeah, he's a warrior, right? He is this dude that's supposed to be like the best at killing and fighting for justice and embodying the values of the culture at the time. He is supposed to be this awesome, awesome guy. But his section starts off super depressing. Like, this does not sound like, be ready, he's coming, ready to kill everything. Like, it's not like the WWE intro for, like, a super kick butt warrior. It's like, the living sorrow of Helfdane's son, and everything was sad. Like, why, why are they starting off his section with this? Starting off, so the living sorrow and no wisdom or strength could help us out. Why, why do you think that he starts off this section like this before we're introduced to who Beowulf it really is? Why do you think they'd start off with such a sad, sappy section? For such a cool, epic action hero. If you're looking for somebody to save the day, is the world going to be perfect? Is it going to start off perfect at the beginning? No. Right? It's going to start off pretty crappy. Because you want somebody that's going to be willing to come in and be the solution to that problem. So here, we're given a problem. There is agony that's hanging over everyone's head. It is just sadness. There's nothing that can break them out of this depression. It is just a horrible, awful situation. But then, we get introduced to Beowulf, who's supposed to be our solution to this problem. Which is where I'm going to have you guys start reading. So from line 109, I'm going to have you guys read from line 109 down to, let's do, let's do line 109 to 140. That should give you a good little section there. It gets us right before a section where it's just him and the king talking to each other. So I don't necessarily want you to read that, but I do want you to read from 109 down to 140. So that should give you a little... Uh, section there. You can still use Read and Write to write down some notes here in class. That's still a viable option. If you want to type it up on Google Docs or just write it on a piece of paper while you're reading, that's fine. I just want you to be prepared because we will discuss this as we keep going. Okay? All right, so 109 to 140, that's what you're uh, reading at this point. So y'all go ahead again. I'll give you like, let's give you about seven minutes. I should give you enough time to work through that. So about seven minutes. You guys should have that red, ready to roll, bring it into the next discussion.